Please grab a seat. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is John. Uh, Johnny, I'm one of the ministers here. And today we're having a Saturday special. Uh, I was writing this script entirely yesterday because I've been struggling all week. I've struggled this week, but not for the right reasons, probably. I've struggled this, re this week because I want to explain to all of you why Gibby is so important. Why Gilgal is so important. What on earth happened at Baal Peor? Um, but you'll be thankful that it all hit the cutting room floor yesterday. There's so much rich context for God's word here. But the word then and the word now is actually a simple word. God is the loving husband. God is the perfect loving husband who will send away his unfaithful wife in the end. But, but he would have her back in a heartbeat. As we come to God's word here today, what I should have been worried about all week is that I should have been having nightmares. How did I spend a whole week reading chapter 9 of Hosea, verse 14, and not having nightmares? I'm a father. What's the prophet pray at this point in his ministry? Give them, O Lord, what will you give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Do you remember the World Vision ads of the starving children in Africa? They shocked you on purpose. God's word is shocking and horrifying and confronting on purpose. God's word is always good, and this good word from God is confronting. It's horrifying. It should be a blood-chilling warning. Knowing that Israel failed to heed this warning should bring us to tears. And as we're going to see, knowing people today still fail to heed this warning should bring even more. Today we've got three short points and a pretty heavy conclusion. God is the perfect loving husband. God will kick out his unfaithful wife. God would have her back in a heartbeat. And our conclusion comes from the fact that God hasn't changed. But first, let us pray. Father, clear our minds that we might hear and understand your word today. Today, Lord, open our hearts. Tear open our hearts with the awful picture of your righteous judgment. Father, please prevent us from keeping the truth of your word at a distance. Father, today may we be comforted by your rod and your staff. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our friend, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. Point one, God is the perfect loving husband. If you remember chapters one to three of Hosea, that was the narrative bit that set up the whole record of his preaching. And we saw that the prophet married an unfaithful whore. And God told him to do that. And God told him to do that in order to illustrate God's relationship with his people. What's his marriage covenant like with his people Israel? So even now in chapters 9 and 10, that image of the broken marriage, the sham marriage, is still the background for all of this. God is still the perfect loving husband. The true romantic, actually. The true romantic who is unbelievably forgiving. And we see glimmers of that rise to the service even in the depths of 9 and 10. God remembers the joys, the glories, the pleasures of that young love. God has not forgotten the wife of his youth. Not at all. Chapter 10, verse 11. Ephraim was a trained heifer that loved to thresh, and I spared her neck. Chapter 10, verse 1. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. Chapter 9, verse 13. Once I saw Ephraim as a young palm planted in a lovely meadow. And I think the richest one of all, the glimpse that we see best is 
Chapter 9, verse 10. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Imagine a grape when you're walking through the desert. Juicy, sweet. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your ancestors. God remembers the joys, the glories, the pleasures of the young love. He's not forgetting, forgotten the wife of his youth. He's still the romantic. After all these years, he's still the romantic. He still plans the romantic weekend getaway. Every year, God has the annual sacrifices. He has the romantic anniversary every, week, every year to which his wife brings her lovers. Israel went to the annual feast described in the law religiously and they would thank idols for the good year that the Lord had given them. Chapter 9, verse 1. Do not rejoice, O Israel. Do not exult as the other nations do. For you've played the whore departing from your God. You've loved the prostitutes' pay on all the threshing floors. Then it goes on to talk about the annual feasts. The Lord provides and they thank golden calves. The Lord gives them fertility and they th sacrifice to the local Canaanite fertility god Baal. I imagine Hosea was actually preaching this for the first time on the road to Bethel. I can imagine him standing by the gate in Bethel, begging people as they wander up for their annual pilgrimage. Do not exalt, O Israel. Do not rejoice as the other nations do. God's the perfect loving husband who throws the weekend getaway and she brings her lovers. And there comes a judgment day. Point two, God will kick out his unfaithful wife. These chapters are a message to Israel. You cannot keep bringing your lovers to our marriage bed. These good times that they're enjoying in Hosea's day, these rich harvests, their wonderful plenty will end. Exile will come. The threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them. They'll have their wonderful harvest, but they'll be in exile. We see that exile, God removing his people from the land he gave them, is what will finally demolish Israel's idolatrous religion. Chapter 9, verse 2. Threshing floor and wine bat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and in Assyria they shall eat unclean food. With the devastation to their religion. Verse 5. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival? And on the day of the festival of the Lord, what will you do? You won't be able to come to Bethel. You'll be in Assyria, in exile, if you're still alive at all. God will kick out his unfaithful wife. Honey, this is over. You can't keep doing this to me. Even the perfect loving husband, the true romantic, has a point. There is seemingly almost no hope for them. How does the two chapters conclude? Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel shall be utterly cut off. Where is the hope? Except that the God who said this through Hosea is the same God that we worship today, who we know has hope. Where's the hope? Of course there's hope. There's hope even in the midst of all this judgment. There's even hope for Israel in Hosea's day. Because God would have them back in a heartbeat. Point three, God would have them back in a heartbeat. There's, there's seemingly no hope for Israel except that the Lord is faithful to himself. God would have her back in a heartbeat. We're going to see that a lot more thoroughly next week in chapter 11. But it's clear even today. Please open your Bibles to chapter 10, verse 12. 
Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness on you. It's time, even now, O Israel, to seek the Lord. Repent, turn back to him, seek him, and you will still reap his unfailing, steadfast love. Because God himself is faithful. The awful thing is that we today know that they did not seek the Lord. They did not heed the warning. It took the exile to break them from their idolatry. We know that they, as a nation at least, did not turn back to God. But we also know that God would have had them back if they turned to him. God is the perfect loving husband. He would have had her back in a heartbeat. And God has not changed. Our God is still the perfect loving husband. God has not changed, and that is really good news. The bad news is, have we changed? In Hosea, we find a confronting, horrifying, blood-chilling warning that is actually relevant for today. We're not inherently better than Israel, and we have a judgment day awaiting us too. Unless we turn back to God and seek Him, unless we repent, there will come a day when Hosea 9.15 is true of us. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Because they have not listened to Him, my God will reject them. They shall become wanderers among the nations. Did you hear that in our gospel reading today as well? Thank you, JC, for reading that for us. What did it say? They come to Jesus wanting to know about, they've heard a story of something that truly awful happened to those people. Why would God do something so, allow something so awful to happen to those people? What's Jesus' answer? Luke 13, 2, he asked them, do you think that because those Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. It's not about them sinning worse. It's about perishing awaits us all. Do you think that the Israelites were worse sinners than you? We still, modern Australians, us even, we still so often plow wickedness and reap injustice like they did. Hosea 10, 13. How many of us are perfectly just? How many of us are perfectly honest and take whatever punishment our mistakes deserve? Or do we twist things to get out of it? We still today do not listen to God, and so God will reject us. Hosea 9, 17. How many of us want to call good what God has called evil? We today still so often consecrate ourselves, set ourselves apart for, devote ourselves to things of shame and become detestable like the thing that we love. Hosea 9, 10. How many of us are more devoted to our club, our hobby, our job, our holidays, our our friends, even our family? How many of us are more devoted to that than our relationship with God? Were the Israelites worse sinners than us? No, I tell you. So unless we repent, we too will all perish. A famous quote from Augustine of Hippo. God has promised forgiveness to your repentance. But he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. 
Hosea 10, 12. It is time to seek the Lord. It was the time then, it's the time now. We've all been warned today, unless we repent, we too will all perish. But God's good news still stands today. He has promised forgiveness to our repentance, and he promised it back then too. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. It's time to seek the Lord. The offer, the promise is open to us. But not only that, God has promised forgiveness to anyone's repentance. There are members of my family who do not seek God. Unless they seek the Lord, they too will perish. Unless you're extremely blessed, there are members of your family who do not seek the Lord. Unless they seek the Lord, they too will perish. But the promise is to them and to us today. Hosea didn't force Israel to listen or believe, but he stood there by the side of the road, I'm imagining. He probably stood there in lots of different places, warning and begging Israel, turn back to God. Here's what awaits you. Here's what you've done. Turn back to God. He will forgive you. Hosea spoke up. And his warning is for us today and for our family today. Hosea chapters 9 and 10 are confronting and horrifying. The more you dig the details, the more you should have nightmares. You should. Because that's how awful sin is. The romantic husband who keeps throwing who keeps arranging the anniversary weekend. And year after year, his wife brings her lovers. God is the perfect loving husband. God will kick out his unfaithful wife. God would have her back in a heartbeat. And God hasn't changed. Were the Israelites worse sinners than us? No, I tell you. So unless we repent, we too will all perish. God has promised forgiveness to our repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to our procrastination. Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're the God who, who loves us, who, who wants us back regardless of what we've done to you. Father, work in us and those we love that we would come to you for forgiveness, knowing that you forgive. Father, help us to seek you while you may be found. Father, help us to trust in this promise. Father, help us not to ignore the warning, but Lord, help us to heed the warning and give us wisdom of how we can share that warning with others. Father, we pray all this confident in your steadfast love. Amen.